Welcome to the next in our future flying series of webinars. I'm Jonathan Hendry, and today we're joined by Fred Finn, who holds the Guinness World Record for the world's most traveled man. Welcome, Fred. Thank you for coming. Hey, back. listen, thank you very much for having me. And it's a pleasure to meet you, Jonathan, really. Lovely. When did your fascination with air aviation and airplanes begin? And what got you into flying in general? Oh, OK. Um, possibly I was born under the the World War II Battle of Britain. So the first aeroplanes I saw were either a Messerschmitt or a Spitfire, and they were firing at each other in real life. And I spent sort of many of my earlier years down an air raid shelter every night, one that we had in the, built in the garden between two houses. And it was serious because my neighbor's house got bombed. It, it was that close. And then immediately after the war finished, they built a Mosquito, that's a twin-engined uh, fighter bomber, built out of balsa wood, most of it, I think, and, and they built, re, installed it in Canterbury. And I remember my, my grandmother pushed me up, and the, you had to go up for, the pilot had to actually put the, hold on, put the legs up first to get in. But I remember being hoisted up into that aircraft. And to this day, uh, piston engines and leather seats, oil gets into the seats, somehow, probably, I can remember the smell. I think I can remember the smell. It may be a vision, but I can. So there was my first experience, and that was in 1945. So I lived probably 10, 12 miles away from a, a little airport called Lim. Okay. It was a World War II airport. That actually, the Silver City freighters mm -hmm. where you drove your car in the front and they took you across the channel for seven and sixpence uh used to used to fly from and it was a grass runway so i kept going there and i kept looking at the aircraft and eventually guy in a tiger moth which is a a, a biplane with an open cockpit said okay we'll take you up how old were you at this point i would have been then uh 1953 13. Um, so, yes, so off it went, and I think, what is it, and, and all there is, a, uh, a you know, get a seatbelt. I think at about 800 to 1,000 feet, they turned it upside down. And, and I realized that there was nothing between me and the ground but a bit of cloth holding me in. But in those days, I thought that was fun. Crazy fun, yeah. So that was my first flight ever. And then... In 1958, I wanted to play cricket professionally, and I would have done, and played for Kent. But my parents decided to move to Devonshire and Exmouth. And I, I landed up at 16 years old in this place that I hated, absolutely hated, because they talked funny in that, to me in those days, and they didn't have a cricket team. That was the end of my life. So I looked for every way possible to get away. And I walked down to the docks one day, and there was a ship there. And I went on board the ship, and I spoke to the captain. I said, can I have a job, please? He said, yes, you can be a deck boy. I, I, that's what I did. And once the little ship sailed out of Exmouth Dock, it was a flat bottom iron boat weighing 400 tons. The movement, I was sick for three days. And we went to Cork in, the, in, the, uh, in Ireland. And I, I got off this ship, but I thought this is what I wanted to try and do. So I approached Shell and Esso in London to work on their oil tanker. So that meant I could study as well as, because I didn't want to go back to school to, when I went back to Devon. So that was what happened. And in 1958, they sent me to, a, 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 they sent a telegram to me, and you joined this ship, STS Hadriana, in Thameshaven. And uh, you meet at the Pope with the rest of the crew, and, uh, and then we join. And, and that was it. And that ship sailed, and we, uh, we spent time on the American coast and down in South America and Caribbean. And uh, I found uh, we used to load up at a place called Lake Maracaibo. I came back after six months, and then Esso approached me and said, we'd like you to work. We've now got a job for you. So they said, we're going to fly you now 
to the States to join your ship. I took off that day in 1958 in a DC-4B, which is like a DC-3 with four engines. And it took three attempts to take off because flames were coming out the engine. And the pilot said, OK, well, we'll get one more attempt. We got off and the next place we landed was Presswick and then Keflavik, and it was an American base, and I remember those greasy sausages. And then it went Bangor, Maine, and then Idlewild. And people, whenever I do a talk, uh, I did the Crystal Cabin Awards, Tim Clark was in my audience of 600 people and the chairman of BMW. Tim stood up and said, so Fred, Tell us about this flight of 19 hours. And where, where's Idlewild? Mm -hmm. I said, well, it's in, in Long Island. He said, no. I said, Tim, you fly there three times a day. Mm -hmm. He said, no, 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 no. I said, I'll put you out of your misery. It's called JFK today. Yeah. So this is just the sort of question you get asked. But that was it. And uh, then they'd fly me back again and I'd fly somewhere else. So for four years, I did that instead of national service. And I progressed until I became a, a navigating officer. And eventually, uh, when I finished, I, I wanted to live in the States. But then I wanted to play cricket. So I did a bit of both. But it fulfilled my dreams. The passion for travel is the greatest thing in the world. It's the greatest education in the world. Because if you and I, like we travel, there'd never be a war because we get along with people. We know how other people think and exist. And it's, it's a wonderful education. And I've ended up in the most uh, horrendous situations. I've been even kidnapped, you know? I mean, it's a... Uh, can, we, can we elaborate on that? Yeah, well, I've been kidnapped. I've landed with the wheels up. I've had an attempted bomb on board and a, an attempted hijacking. When I did my drive around America, I went across the border to San Isidro, which is near San Diego. And I was walking, got off the bus from the border to the town. And uh, I think it was tier one on the other side. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anyway, I remember the rats were like greyhounds. So I was in a bar having, having a drink. And a guy put a gun in my back. And said, follow me. I said, absolutely. <laughs> and it took me to this hotel. And he said, there's my daughter. You're going to marry her. Oh, I, they kept me there all night. Uh, I didn't tell them I was a British citizen, because I was at that time, and therefore I couldn't marry her take her across the border, which, which probably I didn't want to make any ripples. In the morning, I needed to go to the toilet. And I ran down the alleyway, and out the end of the alleyway was a bus, and I jumped on it, and it took me back to the border. Uh, just, that's absolutely true. You know, what an experience. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, and like the first time I went to Nigeria. I landed there on the 2nd of uh, January, probably 1974, and I had to meet my client, and uh, he wasn't there. So I said, well, he knows I'm coming. And, there were, you, you know, I lived in the States, and, you know, to book a call to Nigeria probably took three days. And they didn't only try it three times, and if you didn't get through, you had to start all over again. But I'd send a message to Godfrey. And uh, so I said, where is he? Well, he's, he's gone to his village. It's, Chris, it's Christmas holidays. I said, how far is that? He said, it's Enugu. I said, well, how do I get there? He said, well, we'll get you a car. And I went and I stayed in what was called a hotel. I don't know how they called it a hotel because I had this room and my room at night seemed to be the way to the ladies' toilet uh, from the bar. And bloody rats everywhere, yeah? Anyway, after three days, Godfrey came to look for me. And he said, oh, you found us, how good. And I said, well, what's going on? He said, well, I said, why am I, why am I here like this? He said, we just wanted to see if you could stand it and if you're racist. I said, well, I should punch you on the nose, shouldn't I, really? Which is nothing to do with racist. It's what you put me through. But I have to say, 
until recently that guy was a best friend for years you know and i i got i got along i went to chieftaincy ceremony in in uh, in nigeria where the the chief had a coral ampullets coral waistcoat and his wife probably they got the coral all fashioned in italy champagne stack stack 10 cases here high and champagne was banned in nigeria because they spent too much foreign exchange on it and and i was the only white guy there so uh, I suppose my patience or my mm, inquisitiveness to what I was going for, this, this is why it happened, these sort of things, yeah? Uh, on the wheels up, I flew into, I, I was getting on a flight in London, a Pan Am flight, which was full. And the management there put me on a, a different airline. It was a... a an Asian airline. I'm not going to tell you who it was because it's not right. But we learned, we had this problem and the wheels wouldn't come down. And so they, they opened the bar and I think everybody drained that and, and while the plane was going round and we landed. It was okay. It was a different experience, but it was okay. And, you know, if you fall off a horse, you're supposed to get on it another one quickly. So I was, I'd flown into New York to meet my, my chairman. And instead, when I got out into the terminal and I was checked over, everything was okay. Uh, I went round to the first airline I could see, which was SAS. And I went on a flight to Copenhagen. And when we took off, the flight keeps circling New York, New York, you know, for about an hour. And I said to the girl, what's the problem? She said, well, we don't know quite. I said, well, you don't circle for now. If you don't know, we'd have either gone or come back. I said, the only way they do this is if there's a bomb on board. Shh. Don't say, frighten everybody. She said, it, 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 they're looking. Anyway, it wasn't. And they cleared us to go. And my chairman was very surprised to find me in Copenhagen in the morning instead of in, in New York on Park Avenue. But there we are. And then the hijacking, I was in 1977. My then wife had flown from New York to uh, Hamburg to meet me for dinner. And she, she worked for, in, the, in Pan Am at the time, yeah? And I was, I was supposed to go there at six o'clock in the evening. The plane landed and it didn't go anywhere near a gate. So I'm asking, where, so we're waiting for a gate. But then there was tanks and soldiers surrounding us. I said, this is different. And in those days, it, it, the plane opened the door at back and front. And uh, we waited and waited. And eventually, people ran on from the front and the back, and they grabbed two guys with the guns and took them off. And when I went to the hotel, it was 2 o'clock in the morning. And my wife said to me, where have you been? And I told her, oh, that's a, it's a good story. And, it, and, and actually, it, it appeared in the paper in the morning. So that's probably why that's an ex-wife. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. Yes, I'm concerned when something wrong goes. I'm not stupid, yeah. But I think if they built cars like they built planes, you'd never need another car for you and 10 generations of your family. But I, I, I love everything to do with flying. You know, I, even, even sometimes the bad stuff, when you look back on it, it's kind of exciting. It didn't happen to everybody, you know. Well, so that, so that, was, that was... I've had all these experiences with flying, but I've had the greatest experiences. I've flown in the back, I've flown in first class, and then I flew on Concorde. But it's, it's an amazing life. I'm still flying with people that I flew with on Concorde. Captains, flight attendants. In fact, just last year, one of the flight attendants that um, I knew very well, and I played cricket for Concorde as well, and I, I did a lot of lectures for the, uh, I did the lectures on the QE2 about kinetic friction and what that was regarding Concorde. And people were going one way on the QE2 and one way on Concorde. I could never understand how that was half the price of a Concorde fare because you got a first class ticket on the QE2, which was an amazing way to go. So this is what I got invited to do. And then I, I, I did television programs and interviews and it's, it never stops. 
I, I was a. Uh, they threw a party for my 600th flight on Concord, and they presented me with the cover of Executive Travel magazine, Life Size, which was myself, a Bentley, and uh, Concord, which came the most reproduced magazine cover. Ah. So in 1986, it, it, it went. I think they said to 100 million copies by 1990 have been re and it's still being used. I was on t Channel Five the other night with, with some program about Concord. And there it was. It said, oh, there's Fred Finn. And Captain Walpole, who ran Concord, said, yes, he'd flown more than most of the pilots. The stories you pick up when you... There's never a dull moment. 65 years on, I'm still flying. So you've flown 718 times, is that right? I'm yes, I did. And you've flown, so across, you've flown across the, the Atlantic Ocean 2,000-something times, right? I, I'm sorry? You've flown across the Atlantic over 2,000 times. Oh, 2,000 times, yeah. yeah. And one time, three three times in the same day. What was that for? Well, the reason I was allowed to fly Concorde is very strange because I was working, I was vice president of an American company, and they allowed me to fly with British Airways on Concorde. But it wasn't a goodwill gesture to me. It was the fact that I was more efficient. It saved my company money because I could leave New York at 10 o'clock in the morning I can land at Heathrow at six o'clock. I can be on a flight to Nairobi at 10. And my time was not, not, not visualized sitting on an aircraft. It was where I was working. And also, Concord was more healthy. A, because you didn't spend so much time in an aluminum tube. I don't know if, if it's aluminum or aluminum, whichever way. I'm not, I can't remember which side of the lank it works where. But that was it. And it was pressurized at a lower altitude. Okay. So you didn't get uh, dehydrated. Now, that could lead me on to jet lag. Yes, I was about to ask, did it make your jet lag better or worse? Flying no such flying thing as jet lag. It's all a bloody rumor. <laughs> it's a rumor put out by flight attendants to start with. Uh, jet, you never got jet lag in a propeller aircraft because of the atmosphere because it didn't go high enough. In fact, I flew the first aircraft to get pressurized, which was a Constellation. We had a lovely looking airplane with three tails. I would look like a bit of a fish, but that was, I think, carried 47 passengers nonstop, and it was pressurized, so it flew above, they said, above the turbulence. And then when Concorde came out, it flew at 58, 60,000 feet, yeah. which flew above the turbulence. So I don't know who was, there was a bit of a bit of marketing going on there. <laughs> but the jets, the, the air came through the engines, so it was baked. So here you are in aluminum tube, the air's coming in, it's baked and dry, so you get dried skin, dried eyes. And I put out a lot, a lot of my um, model for not getting jet lag is to keep your skin moisturized and close your eyes every hour for 10 or 15 minutes because then they become moist and go to bed at the local time. And, and that's how I, how I did it. Uh, but nowadays, the 787, the Dreamliner, you know it's pressurized at a lower level. Mm. And the air doesn't come through the engines. It comes like the old planes and it's fresh air coming in rather than baked air. So if, if you, you know, and, and again, if, you, if you're checking in at Heathrow to go to America, you're up early, you wonder if the flight's going to be on time, you wonder if the car to the airport's on time, did you lock the door, did you get through security all right, then your plane's on time or late, then you fly to Miami or you're going holiday, right, or Florida, somewhere, and that's an eight, ten-hour flight. Time you get there, then you've got to go through U.S. facilities. Well, that's 24 hours probably, and then you then you're, you're actually cream crackered, you know, you're, you're done. So... It's jet lag, that's what it's about. It's about being tired and, and dehydrated more. I've never suffered with jet lag because it's a mindset. I, I live, eat and dream the time I'm getting to. And when, I, when they close the door on the plane, I turn my watch to where I'm going to and live, and live in that time on the board, the aircraft. So by the time I get there, I'm pretty much accustomed to it. I used to do a lot of my flights in the, in the flight deck with the captain, you know, and I, I put on the headset and I could talk to them. And I think at times they favoured me to sit there. Then they didn't have to say no to someone else 
because I was so used to it. They used to tell me, oh, we've got Mr. Guccione on board, so we've given him your seat. You'll have to sit on the flight deck. I said, well, have you told the captain I'm going to be sitting in his office? No, they don't know. I said, no, you, it's, you have to ask him because I'm going to have my red wine no matter what. I don't care where it is. That's yeah. my, my relaxation. Now I'm going home. Uh, okay. And on one particular flight, I'm at the headset on and the concourse coming the other way. And they said, look to David Lina coming the other way. It's been 46 miles a minute. And I asked the question, coming in the opposite direction, does it cancel out the spe speed of sound? They said, no, the light sound travels at the speed of light, which completely flummoxed me and it still does. So I, I didn't get into that, but that's what I did. And um, one night I'm staying with this captain and it's about 11 o'clock at night. He lived in uh, Camberley and he said, we're going now to, to the airport in Concord. I said, okay. So we take the aeroplane out and he's got to do a brake test. So we're charging down the runway late at night, testing the brakes. And I'm, I'm like, he said, there, yeah, it's yours, take it. And he said, what do you think? I said, it's amazing. Yeah, quite positive, isn't she? So I'm probably the only person in the world that sat in the flight deck of Concord with my hands on the controls, taking it down the runway. And it's taken me to places like Kenya. Kenya is my favorite country on the whole planet. Do you know how many countries you've been to? 150. 115? 105, 150. It was 130. And, and, see, they kept, they kept breaking up and you got new countries over the years. So I've been to 150 countries. There's some I haven't been to, some I don't want to go to. I've no particular desire to go to North Korea. Um, I've no particular desire to go back to, to Tehran. I was a hostage there during the, during the revolution when they held the American... Uh, guys in the American embassy. I said, Kenya is my favorite country. I've been going there since 1958. And it's the most diverse country on earth, as far as I'm concerned. It has, it has a mountain, not Kilimanjaro, the real one, Mount Kenya, with glaciers and, and proper climbing. 20 minutes from there, Lake, the Lake Nakuru with the flamingos and Lake Navasha, and not far away, the coast. The Diani Beach is as good as it gets. And I stay at the same hotel down there forever. And it's nice because once I get off the plane in, in Nairobi, I feel at home. But the, the climate is a fantastic climate. I'm, I'm going back to Kenya. I, I mean, I just feel so happy when I'm there, you know. It's, but it's, 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 it's a good climate and the people are nice. Wow, crazy. Speaking of favorite things... Small change. What is your favorite besides the Concorde? Obviously, did you have other favorite planes? Because you've probably flown on so many kinds. Oh, of well, the modern aircraft I like is the seven eighty seven. It's a technological dream that aircraft, and I like the way you press the button and the shade comes down into sunlight or dark. But it, it's a healthy aeroplane to fly on, um, and I, I think, yeah, yeah, that's. I don't like. I was a big fan of the 747, you know. It was big and ugly, but beautiful because of its, its way. Yeah. And, and it's like an old pair of shoes. It was very comfortable. Did you get to fly in the front? Because in the front seats upstairs, you can see forward instead of side. Uh, well, it, it varied over the years. Okay. But when Pan Am brought out the 747, this is how people trusted each other. He and the guy that ran Boeing, they, they signed on the letter, we'll do this. And so that's how 747 came about. But the best dining room in the world was on Pan Am 747. What they did, you know, upstairs then it wasn't as big because it grew back a bit in the years following. But the Pan, Pan Am, the, the uh, 747-200 or 100 only had three little portholes. And they had up there two tables of two and two tables of four. And the crew, the flight attendants, were trained in silver service at the Savoy Hotel in London. So when you sat down, the guy would come with a big menu. You'd choose what you want. And you'd have your drinks. And about 45 minutes to an hour later, they'd come and they'd say, your table's ready. And of course, I was probably alone most of the time, so I never knew who I was going to sit next to. Um, but upstairs you went, proper silver service. 
and everything was cooked on board. So if you wanted rare beef, it was one end that was trying to run away, and the other end was well done. And they served the caviar, all the, all the ice was frozen around the bottle, and, and uh, not the vodka rather, and the caviar, big grey caviar, as much as you wanted. You can keep, keep, they kept giving it to you. I think what didn't get consumed by the crew, perhaps passengers got consumed by the crew. But um, Pan Am was a brilliant airline in those days. But it was a, what they call legacy airline. And, and with, with all the startups and deregulation, it, in the end, it couldn't hack it. You know? And then the crash didn't do them any good. It wasn't their fault. But they stayed away from it. Yeah. But nowadays, look, 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 you've got British Airways. I like British Airways because I'm used to it. I'm used to the colour, I'm used to the decor, I'm used to the crew. So I go back to the old pair of shoes routine. They may not be the best looking, but they're the most comfortable. It's not just about comfort. I mean, if you're flying first class or business class, you're going to have a reasonably comfortable seat. I think with whomsoever you fly. But it's more than that. When I walk onto a British Airways flight, somebody's going to know me. Or somebody's going to know of me. And they come out and talk to me. Or they want to come and talk to me. Sometimes I want to have a kip and they don't want... No, no, you, you, they want to talk. So it's a big family thing, yeah? And I love it. it it's, it's like going back to a hotel that you know well. Yeah, oh, that's a very good analogy, yeah. And, it, and it's very familiar to you. You know what you're going to get. You know exactly what to expect. And sometimes they even surprise you. I got a letter last time I flew with them. And from the whole crew, you know, you're an ideal passenger. Thanks for sharing with us and coming flying with us. And it's, it's lovely to have you. Stay in touch. Keep flying. Cool. And my logbook, that one guy said, thanks for paying our wages. <laughs> and one guy said, he said, one well, British Airways captain in my logbook, he said, well, you're the only guy I know that's flown more than a whole crew put together. Everybody knows me as Fred because that's who I am. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't go out my way to be normal. I am normal. And when I say normal, I'm not highfalutin. I'm, I'm not terribly posh. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not always, but I'm Fred. And everybody knows me as such and they know what to expect from me. And it's, it's quite nice to be Fred. I like what I am, you know, exactly. but uh, you, sorry. what would you say? What would you say if you wanted to make, because obviously you speak with a lot of flight attendants um, very often as a passenger, what would you think is ways that you could help make flight attendants days better or cheer them up, you know, on all these travels, especially long haul? I, I always turn up at, to start with at the airport early because I don't like peer head jumps because something can go wrong and, and there's enough stress getting through everything on time. But people do it all the time. And in fact, they, they, they're so bad at times that they, they're late, but they've got to go to duty free and they're holding the whole bloody plane up because it would take longer to take their bags off than to find the people. Yeah. And then they get on, oh, sorry. Like they're not sorry at all because they've got the bloody shopping with them, haven't they? <laughs> but it's, it's, I think to turn up early, move through, through whatever you've got to do, uh, make sure you've got the right paperwork and have it ready. Try to be calm. Turn up in time. Make sure you, you've not packed anything in your bag that's not supposed to be there and because you're going to lose it otherwise. <laughs> um, I would always pack in reasonably. I, I always dress properly to fly, but casual, smart casual. So they come in. Make sure that if you take your shoes off during the flight, that they slip on shoes and you can get it back on again. <laughs> because your feet are likely to swell. Oh, yes, your point. And, and, and it, you're not, you, you may not get your shoes back on again, and that's very embarrassing. Um, I always wear slip, slip on shoes when I'm flying because you never know, you might get them take off as you go through security. Sometimes I'll take them off and say, take my shoes through and bring them back because I'm not going to walk on your dirty floor. <laughs> unless you provide some cover. Oh, bless your heart. Oh, no, I mean, I, I, they made me walk through this thing where you put your hands up, yeah? yeah. And it was, it was polished. And I fell and I cracked my bloody ribs because of it. And I was in bloody agony. 
and that meant I had to fly with a crack route all the way to London from to, well, from uh, you, from Kiev one day. Goodness gracious! Yeah, and that's the other favourite country I go to is, is Ukraine. I like it because it takes me back to my childhood with gardens and fresh produce and countryside and nature. Oh, bless here. I have two more questions because I know you probably lunchtime for you. Um, back to your Guinness World Record. Was that a record that you tried to set out for Most Traveled Man, or did it just happen organically? No, neither, neither one of my records did I set out to do on purpose. I mean, I was commuting across the Atlantic for years before Concord came out. Okay. And when it did, I did it because I was living in, in America and then in Nashville at that time. I didn't have much idea what Concord was all about. But because of my record of flying, I, I got an invite. 25th of May, 1976, I flew from Washington to London, which was on the return of the first commercial flight to the USA. The first, and I have a baggage tag from that flight. The first, I'll show you in a minute. The first transatlantic crossing, and that baggage tag was blue and leather and the shape of Concord, and it was on my bag for every flight and every flight thereafter. And it's still printed and lovely, you know, it's gorgeous. But the uh, Concord was different. First off, it was in DC, Dallas. There's no gate. The lounge goes down and drives you to the plane. And all I saw was this long shape. And then and they were boarded. And uh, Yes, I had to duck to get through the door, but I could walk down the middle of Concord, no problem. And uh, they put me in seat 9A. And that became my seat for as long as I fly the Concord. And uh, where the ones in the museum, when people sit in that seat at the technical tour, or they say that's the seat that the most traveled person, Fred Finn, sat in. You see, so it, it stuck with me. The, uh, the friendship on Concord, the club-like atmosphere. I played cricket for them. I used to take the booze off for them in Heathrow because every bottle that was open, the crew could pay 50 pence for. But they couldn't take it through customs. So in my briefcase, I once got 17 bottles in it. It was a bit heavy and a bit bulky. <laughs> But I went through, the customs had gone home. In any case, there were open bottles. <laughs> and we used to meet at the Green Man pub, and I'd hand it over to them, and they did the same for me in New York. Aww. So it was really, this is how it went. And to, to this day, I talk at dinners, and there'll be somebody that I flew with on Concord there, for a crew member. And one in Manchester said, OK, she said, Knowing full well that she was, well, she was my friend, she said, so which was your favourite flight attendant on Concord? And I said, Julie, do you, have to, do you tell your kids which is the favourite one of your kids? <laughs> I said, well, don't expect me to do that then. Would you? <laughs> I know. But it, it was an experience. And now I didn't set out to do any records. Because of my work, I was flying 10, 11 months a year. I used to make contracts for people to manufacture in third or na uh, growing nations to manufacture for themselves rather than spend foreign exchange they didn't have. So I had to work with the government, Minister of Finance, Minister of Labour, Minister of this, this and that, and then the private sector, and all with their law and US law. So I studied it and I have... Uh, a degree in international law and marketing. But it used to still take about three years to put a contract together wow. to work everything out. And then I would leave them enough to do to the next stage. But then they'd say, oh, Fred, we've got a problem. You need to come back. So I was circling the world. And I'd go fly down to Rio de Janeiro, to Buenos Aires. I'd come back to Rio, take Concord to, uh, to, the, to Africa, to, to, to Paris, to Tehran, and back then to London and back to New York. It was like this all the time. People began, to, I'm talking specifically about Concord. When I was flying before Concord, because I flew a lot with British Airways and a lot with Pan Am, they obviously got to know me. In fact, so much so 
on one Pan Am flight, the, the manager in London, I was going to New York, he used to meet me and we were friends, Ron, Ron McBride, he was called. And he said, Fred, they've got two lobsters on today. It's not on the menu. Would you like them? I said, yeah, that's nice. So he told the flight attendant, the two lobsters you've got are for Fred, okay, he's sitting in 5J. So off we went. And it came round to, because they go round, and I'm, I'm the last, because 5J is the last seat on the right-hand side. And they said, what would you like for your lunch? I said, well, it's already decided that the two lobsters are not on the menu. Oh, no, 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 you can't have those already gone. I said, where are they gone? She said, well, that lady and her eight-year-old son. I said, you give, you give one of my lobsters to an eight-year-old. I said, how nice. I said, That's, you know they were ordered for me, don't you? They were put on board for me. Ah, well, that's tough. And then the captain came down. He said, I want to see your ticket. And I said, well, you're not really entitled to see my ticket because here I am sitting in first class and, and, that's, and I think your whole attitude of this crew is a bit strange to me and a bit something I'm not used to. Anyway, two days later, I got a call from the president of Pan Am. He said, would you mind coming up to Pan Am and having breakfast with me tomorrow morning? I said, no. He said, because you're not going to believe this. The crew put in a report about you demanding stuff that you're not supposed to have because they think you're part of the crew, that you fly so often with us. So he said, we're having a crew get together for the next three days in uh, yeah, Rockefeller Center. He said, I want you to come and sit next to me on the top table while this is going on so everybody's aware of who you are in future. Mm. So that's what happened. Um, and really, I, I don't have any problems when I'm flying up, but that, that was a bit strange for me. Um, but then Concord, of course, being a, a really high uh, notice airline, in fact, who, who is this guy that's flying on Concord so frequently once a bloody week? And people come in and do interviews, at, at, at take this and that, and it, it was quite surprising, actually. Concorde, the British one, it was actually, the, the, it made more money than any other aircraft for British Airways. It made half a billion pounds of raw profit. Because, first off, here is a financial centre, but Paris isn't, and it's closer to New York. Therefore, you can go to supersonic quicker. Also, British Airways did the charters, they did round the Bay of Biscay flights for an hour and a half, but they weren't supersonic. And people said, Christ, I didn't have a spec I could fly on this plane. And, you know, and it was probably £100, or they could go to lunch in Cairo and back. But then there were various Concord clubs that arranged charters, and they made a lot of money from those. And the, the, the one charter I was on, uh, not the flight, I was on the QE2, telling the passengers what they were to expect. And as we got back to England, uh, well, the, the first days out, the captain called me to his office and he said, Mr. Finn, I want to know what you're doing. We have a problem. I said, really? What's that then? He said, I said, I'm doing two lectures of 45 minutes. He said, but we have a problem, Mr. Finn. It's not right. I said, well, tell me what the problem. And he winked at me. He said, people can't get into your lecture. Would you mind doing one every day? And then you can sit at my table for dinner every night. I said, is that a deal? I said, OK. What else was I going to do? But when we approached the UK, have you seen the photograph with Concord, the Red Arrows, and the QE2 in the English Channel? Very iconic. Photograph. Yeah. I was asked to come to the bridge, and I'm an honorary Red Arrow. Now oh, that's led to another story. I flew with the Red Arrows. So this, the, the, the team leader, Tim Miller, I had him in one ear and a Concorde pilot in this ear and I'm telling the passengers what's going on. So I was actually part of that and it was quite a phenomenal. So I, I flew with the Red Arrows and then they asked me, will I bring some guests along? So I took Richard Brenton and he, he did it. And they take you on a, what they call a, 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 a find out flight first. Yes, yeah. My first experience, because when you're flying in the hall, all you can see is that, that much of the helmet. You can't see his hands. So they take you over the, the bridge up near Scampton um, and they flip you upside down. 
but you don't know it's going to happen. So they test you before you can do the proper flight. And they say, you've got gloves, you got this, that. If you're sick, you clean it up, right? But when I was flying with the team, you had something to focus on. But on their own, ooh, not so bad. And that led to me flying the last flight of the Phantom F4 jet, the RAF Watterson. I was invited. So who will I take? So I took David Gower, because he got banned from the England captaincy for flying around Melbourne in a Tiger Moth during a test match. And I took Ron Dennis, who owns McLaren. And I was just had a deal. I was just drove in the British Grand Prix celebrity race for McLaren the day before we wanted to go. Oh, yes, he said, we'll do that. He thought it was total nonsense, you know. So we fly up in the, in the McLaren jet then. Okay. So I got permission from the Air Ministry and the Air Force to land at RAF Frostington, the private jet. And we trained. You have to do a bit of training to fly on this plane. And then we took off two by two down the runway with a photographer, three of us. And the, fl- the guy that flew me with the red arrows had now t- come off the red arrows and flying phantoms. And this plane climbed 18,000 feet a minute straight up. And I was probably one of four civilians at the dinner that night when there was nobody lower than a group captain. I mean, all the top brass were there because they'd all flown phantoms in their day. And, uh, yeah, we tried to keep one for the heritage flights, but the Americans wanted, uh, because it was originally a, a seaplane, they wanted strip wires on the runways. They wouldn't let us have the afterburners. Oh, it took two years of arguing with them. In the end, it didn't go but this again, all, and, and when we flew out to, to fly that aircraft, they gave us the last Rolls-Royce Phantom car okay. that Fergie later got married in to take us out to the aircraft. So all of this stuff is just because I flew. And I, I get so much pleasure from it. And, and I know uh, my, my flights are real sit-in-the-seat miles. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk on here about anybody else. Everybody's aware of who's doing what to whom and why. But the other, the other guy who claims to have done so forth, it's flown 19 million. Uh, he's got 19 million flight award miles. And that was put out by United Airlines last week. But I've had calls from this guy's brother saying I'm in collusion with the Guinness Book of Records. Uh, I, I've, I've told them not to put this person in. Um, and 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 you're you, you just don't want to admit it. I said, well, it, you try and work it out. And I said, if you you can't fly twelve hours a day for eight years mm-hmm. without stopping. And award miles are also, you know, for our listeners, um, awarded differently based on the class of service, not necessarily just the miles that you fly. So you've you know flown. Yeah, and if, if, if you I, I put that, down the miles, I put, put down my points miles, which I don't get points. I have a letter from British Airways at the time that said this is to introduce Fred Finn. And I was sort of an unofficial ambassador, right? So I got so many f- tickets a year for British Airways, Concord of first class. And we're still in now because the management's changed. We still, it, it was open ended because I couldn't use those tickets all the time I was flying for my job. But I didn't have the time. So the letter was purely left open-ended and, and British Airways are still arguing about it. So we'll finish this argument off shortly because they, they still get, whether I like it or not, they're still getting lots of publicity from me because I'm, I'm related to Concord and, and, and that's my legacy, I suppose, because that record will never be beaten. But I'll be very pleased if somebody reads my record, I'll be very pleased to shake them by the hand I didn't set out to break records. It happened because of my job. And I and I I kept a logbook because I always had a junior pilot's log thing, yeah, and, 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 and I wanted to do so. It wasn't to maintain a record. I mean, I had one captain said, well, he said, your, your, your book is like a, a celebrity history. <laughs> and he said, I've worked out that you're flying 700 times around the earth. And then he said, I looked back through this amazing chronicle of travel and found out that four years ago, I flew you from somewhere to somewhere. Mm-hmm. And this, 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 I mean, it's quite un- unreal. You know, you get this 
association. And uh, I just I just came back from somewhere and and the crew said, can you stay on a bit? We want to have a picture with you before you get off. I said, okay. You know, why not? It makes some of this day. I do, I just enjoy it. It's an absolute passion with me, yeah. With all of these stories, you must be writing a book. It comes out. Tell us, tell us uh, all about this book. My book will come out in September. We haven't decided on an, a final name yet, but it looks... The name that favorite at the moment is Tales, T-A-L-E-S, Tales of Finn, which will have a Concord tale and then the tale of a few other airlines I've flew, flown on, yeah? Um, I don't know what, what it will, will finally be, but we'll know very soon. Um, and it chronologizes me from basically when I first airplanes I saw, moving to Canada, being transferred to the States, marriage, Cricket, but Concord and British Airways are very big chapters. Now it's uh, they've, they've um, ordered the first 5,000 and the second 5,000 print run. The launches are coming up. In fact, I'm going to have a launch in London, two, two or three of them. I will be there, call me. You're absolutely welcome as my personal guest, okay? Yeah. Um, I was going to, yes, you are. Um, so it's now becoming exciting. I've been, people have been telling me about this book. Why are you going to do 10, 10 or 12 years ago when I was taking people, I was in, in I, I was able to take party twice to Pomeroy Champagne in, in Rheem. And a guy from the times wrote about my book, which that was maybe 20 years ago now. So it's been a long time in the coming. Uh, and I couldn't remember everything unless it, like somebody like you is asking a question. And, and it jogs the old hard drive back there as to what went on. And this is how somebody questioned me for six months and we got the chapters. And then the publisher said, well, you, you write as you talk and it's not commercial enough. So we, we then got a, a, a ghostwriter who's very, very good at it. This will be finished by August and it, it'll come out. I want it to all the Concord anniversaries, you see. This year is 20 years of, since it flew. So, yes, and uh, it's, it's, it's quite a thrill to have a book, you know, right? And it's, it's, look, it's a new thrill for me. So what else am I doing apart from flying and writing? and organizing trips to Kenya. Quite um, a busy man for 83. Uh, it's, a, it's a long day as I'm still going, but I've got a, 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 a travel app. Okay, yes, tell us about this. Um, there was a, a, a thing called Seek Guru. Right. And, and, and everybody knew about Seek Guru at the time. But Seek Guru was bought by TripAdvisor and it's useless. And why, I mean, it's because nobody's updated it for four years. All right. I think they might have about 150 aircraft or something on it, whatever they've got. You might be booking on there and the aircraft not flying anymore. Seatmaps.com, we've got over 750 different aircraft. And you can actually walk on the aircraft that you're going to fly on and choose your seat. And the map that you get, of your seat is the actual one, not a graphics that you get from most airlines, and you might not be where it actually is. I mean, so this is, um, it's used by uh, online ticket people that when they, when they need it. And we uh, are number two to Seat Guru, only because Seat Guru has a name, and I think we'll probably. Uh, get hold of Sikh Guru name at some point in time, only because of the name. We've got so many more aircraft. Um, you can act, I mean, one of the things we did, you can actually walk on the aircraft you're flying in, and if your knees touch the front seat, it showed up red because it sc scanned your legs, you know, just... Wow. And it would ask you, do you want to move? And you get up from that seat and find a seat that's more comfortable for you, and it tells you what it costs you. 
Interesting. Uh, it was pretty amazing. It was actually, uh, actually instant. And uh, it shows you, you can walk around the cabin, you can see where the galley, it, you can do everything. And seatmap.com it's called. And, and I, would, I wouldn't travel without it. Which, That's a big testament then. Well, because the, the actual seat plans of airlines is not, is not, is not live, it's static. Um, so yes, we we're growing. I mean, the, the pandemic didn't help anybody growing something from startup, yeah. Um, but we want to succeed with this. I think we're going to do so. But it takes people in the. It takes time for people to pay you right, from the usage they get from. We 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 charge sort of a rental to the uh, online ticket agencies. That you, you know, there's plenty of them. Uh, but they've all got to go through accounting. So it's, it's, we're always three or four months behind. And that money, we need development. And I, I, I must say that my, the guy that developed this, he, he was a Ukrainian. And Ukrainian's technology is fantastic. They, you, when, before the war, you went to a call center, it would probably be in somewhere in Ukraine. And they're very good at that. And this guy was with Microsoft, and they moved him and his family to Germany. So while he was working with Microsoft, he, he, he thought he would like to develop something for airlines that everybody would use. And it would be, I mean, so this is like a bit of a Microsoft, did a bit of everything. So, so that's what seatmap.com is all about. Um, it's, it's fantastic. It really is. I, 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 Everybody should use it. It doesn't if you if you're private, it doesn't cost you anything to use it anyway. You just have to subscribe. So there we are. There's there's what I've done. I'm a very happy guy. I wake up happy. And people say, Why did you wake up? Why are you smiling? I said, Well, you know, there's a, a thing that you, that you can live three score years and ten. I'm already plus thirteen. And I wake up in the morning and I'm alive. That's enough reason to be happy. Yeah. So that's that's me in a nutshell. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Finn, for joining us on our Future Flying series of webinars. It's been an absolute honor to talk to you. And best of luck with your app and happy anniversary again, too. Well, Jonathan, thank you. And well, what an honor to have you as well. And to It's been a pleasure. A real you. pleasure. I've enjoyed it a lot. Oh, cheers. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon. Happy anniversary. God bless you, Jonathan. Thank you. In addition to our daily YouTube videos, Simple Flying publishes over 150 articles every week. If you're looking for the latest aviation news and insights, visit simpleflying.com.